thanks very much for coming along. Um, Sam couldn't hear me very well there in the front, so uh, we will endeavour to speak up. But um, thank you for joining us in the legendary Hard Rock Cafe Glasgow, and thank you to them for hosting us. This is the second in a series of creative conversations from the Scottish Music Industry Association. I'm Dougal Perman, chair of the SMIA, which is a trade body for music. And we represent um, all music industry, all music businesses operating in Scotland with the intention to strengthen and champion music business in our nation. And one of our main projects is the Scottish Album of the Year Award, which launched today with accepting submissions for eligible albums, which will then be chosen by a pool of 100 um, impartial nominators, and then a panel of judges, of which our guest tonight, Stuart Cosgrove, has kindly agreed to be one, will have the uh, difficult task of, um, of whittling down this um, selection to eventually come up with a winner. Um, and then in these conversations, this is really an opportunity to find a bit about some of the people behind what we consider to be really important aspects of the music scene in Scotland and the music story of Scotland. So I'm delighted to be joined by Stuart Cosgrove. Thank, Thank you, you, Dougal. Pleasure to be here. And um, we're going to talk today about um, some of Stuart's journey through music media, particularly. And um, my background from a music and music business point of view is mostly in music media. And um, so it's something I'm passionate about. But uh, we'll also invite questions later on from the floor. Um, you can see that we are filming it this evening. This is for the SMIA website. But when we come to edit it, we will not use the audience Q&A part, so you can uh, feel free to have a more frank discussion um, come that time. Tam already uh, asked when he could heckle, and uh, I don't think there's any holding you back, so you're welcome to heckle at any point, but um, I will shout you down if it's not appropriate at the time. Um, but Stuart, you... Um, People will know you for many things, as a broadcaster, as a writer. Um, but you began your music journalism career at the NME, is that right? That, uh, that's right. Uh, I, I went to the NME uh, in the early 80s, and one of the kind of uh, glory periods of the NME, I was uh, fortunate, fortunate to be uh, employed by them after a vacancy created by the departure of Julie Burchill. Um, so this is in a kind of post-punk era, if you like, and I was the <coughs> successful applicant uh, for, for that vacancy. So, yeah, I, I had a great four or five years at the NME, um, uh, a period I look back on with a lot of warmth. I wasn't always necessarily perfect there. In fact, I was given the, the nickname the Hip Hop Hitler um, because um, my, uh, one of my roles, I'd, I'd actually been working for another newspaper called Black Echoes, which was another weekly newspaper focusing on dance music, on reggae, on hip hop. And I had been uh, very much a kind of uh, mouthy advocate of black American music, which remains my key passion up until this day. And I had been a bit of a thorn in the side in the editorial uh, focusing of the NME, in, in part because the NME historically had been, um, for better or for worse, a newspaper that was, um, that was kind of beloved uh, by the indie rock uh, fraternity and had become almost obsessed, maybe even stuck in a groove that believed that, you know, four white guys uh, in a bedroom somewhere near Stoke were going to change the world, you know. And um, this was at a time when really exciting bands were coming out of the independent music scene in the early days of hip-hop, not least people like Run DMC and Public Enemy and whatever. And I thought that they were naturally aligned to the NME, and because of their kind of strident uh, political kind of views, I couldn't believe that the NME w w wouldn't consider placing them in the front cover. I remember a very uh, vocal dispute that we had at an editorial one week where a dear friend of mine, Adrian Thrills, uh, had done an interview with a band, I think they were from Norwich, 
and their name was Grab Grab the Haddock, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I had done this uh, interview with Public Enemy, and I just said, you are kidding. You're going to put Grab Grab the Haddock <laughs> on the front page of the fucking NME when there's, when there's um, Public Enemy? And it, and it was a bit of a kind of stooshy at the steamy and all the rest of it, and we argued, and then we went for a drink together and whatever. But one of the things I didn't know at the time, and only subsequently found out after I'd left the paper uh, and had actually moved by this time to Channel 4, I met one of the executives who said, do you remember all that big fight about public enemy? And he said, you know, there was another agenda for us in the editorial, which was at the time, I mean, strange as this may seem, uh, the NME had um, to uh, pulp its covers in South Africa if there was a black band on the cover, because it was the height of the kind of late apartheid era, and they had to change the cover and put another band on the cover, thus uh, bringing new cost uh, into the organisation uh, of the newspaper at the time. So the, the, the senior, senior management, by this I'm meaning the executive management, were never keen on there being a black band on the cover because it meant extra cost for them. Wow. I didn't discover that until years after <coughs> I'd left, but yeah. it, was, it left a bit of a kind of thorn in my side about that was the reason. It wasn't actually to do, although I'm sure that some of my colleagues were arguing truthfully that they believed that, you know, a band that were maybe, or, or often they, they knew that circulation went up if they put the Smiths on the front cover, or whatever. So there was lots and lots of reasons why people were arguing for that. But I argued for uh, dance music, for new music, for uh, electronic music, for house, for hip hop, for the rave scene and all of that. And that was my, my, my uh, vocation at, at uh, NME. And many of these scenes, especially hip hop, really logical progression from punk, you could yeah. argue. Yeah, you could. And, and also remember as well that there was already the beginnings of significant crossover of those two big motorways or tributaries of, of, of music. Uh, you know, I'm thinking maybe, you know, like the big, a big album like Screamadelica or whatever actually was clearly coming out of the culture of the independent uh, music scene the indie scene, but it was also something that was deeply immersed in dance music and embracing that and whatever. So in lots of ways, those, those, those um, two kind of big things that we always assumed were opposites were beginning to attract, you know. And from the NME, you went on to The Face. Yes. Which was uh, really quite a different type of magazine. Yeah, I, I was seen by some hardcore NME, NME uh, journalists is a bit of a traitor, basically, you know, because this, the face was about c the clothes you wear, the, the things you hang in your front room and the drugs you take and all of that. And I was kind of, to some extent, uh, always interested in style. That was the, the, the kind of de rigueur word of the era. And it was, uh, the face was referred to as the best dressed magazine of that era in the 1980s. It was hugely important in terms of kind of framing the way in which we think about design, uh, about graphics, about the way in which music connects uh, beyond merely the sound itself, but kind of the communication of the music, the cults, the scenes, the subcultures and all of that. The, the, the NME had elements of that, but they were buried often towards the back of the newspaper um, and the big interviews were at the front. The face sort of subsumed all of that stuff and made it made it its own, really. You know, it was a great magazine. I mean, it's long gone now because I think its time has gone and so much has changed with the web and all the rest of it. But for a period of six or seven years, it was probably the most influential magazine Britain's ever produced in youth culture. You know, I was in it once. Were you? Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, what happened? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> they did a feature on uh, Glasgow alternative music. In wow. Probably yeah. about 2003, uh -huh. four, so after you'd, long after you'd gone to Channel yeah. 4. But um, yeah, there was a very awkward photo shoot in the 13th note. Yeah. Um, but it was quite, it was quite good fun. Yeah. Um, but I think like we talked before this about how really you wouldn't have Vice if you hadn't had the face. No, I think if you look at things like Vice now and, and uh, online propositions like that, they, they have that sense of wanting to write about music, but also about culture, mm. or also about the politics of style, or whatever it is, they've got that wider kind of range, but but you know what, there's a kind of thing as well, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big 
big believer in the value of the skinny, the uh, Scottish newspaper, and I buy it, or oh, I don't buy it, I pick it up every time I, I pass it, you know, and it has some of the kind of origins there of the NME, you know, that mm. sense of a passion for the new, uh, and also a kind of political, you know, seam running through it. Uh, and also it's kind of, whilst it's music led, it's still interested in other areas of, of life, comedy, uh, movies and things like that. So uh, I think that those newspapers like the Skinny have a, a debt to hand back to the NME. And in lots of ways, they're much better than what the NME is now, which is effectively an online brand, you know? Yeah, absolutely. The NME has sought to be like MTV in a lot mm. of ways. Um, and MTV kind of moved into being a, a big mainstream music brand quite a long time, time ago. ago yeah. Successfully so, yeah, you yeah. could argue. But um, uh, so you think things like the Skinny and, and then perhaps independent music blogs are a more natural progression or evolution of what the NME was when you were there? Yeah, I, I think also because they've got <coughs> a, a very clear purpose. I mean, the, the Skinny's been um, expanding over the last three years. In fact, I was down in their Manchester office last year, and, and it's just great seeing something that emerged out of Scotland spreading in that way and having a kind of status uh, that's, that's worth kind of talking about and whatever. Uh, and it's clearly found, it's probably been quite hard to do this, but it's clearly found uh, a, a new kind of business model, which is about how do we give this thing away free but at the same time generate enough revenue from it uh, to keep the editorial strong and to keep the kind of, the, the, you know, the culture around it um, vibrant, whatever. That's not an easy thing to pull off, you know. No, but they always did it. They mm. were always free. Yeah. Whereas there's, it's a big deal if a, a paid-for publication becomes a free sheet, yeah, really, isn't yeah, it? it? Yeah, 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 that's a, right. It's yeah. a difficult one to yeah. countenance that, yeah. and of course the enemy had to... Uh, the enemy went free, that. and then there's a question there about whether people distrust it more because they think, well, I used to value this because I paid a pound for it. Now mm. I'm getting it free. It must be inferior, you know? Yeah. And the skinny didn't have that. It had the complete opposite, actually, you know? Um, <clears throat> do you think that has an impact on the editorial and on what they're, you know, whether they're, they still have the same kind of confidence in what they're writing about? Well, I think that one of the challenges is that once you have become the kind of brand that, say, the NME is now, you have a team of people that are kind of involved in the sort of digital ad sales world of looking for kind of, you know, algorithmic advertising and whatever. And, and often there's a tendency, especially if you're doing the NME stage at Glastonbury and you're expanding the brand into that area, there's a tendency for you to quickly do um, partnerships with commercial brands. And we know that that can be hugely, we know that that can be hugely rewarding but it can also have that kind of slightly contaminating effect as well because there are relatively few brands around, commercial brands, that are completely synonymous with the NME's existing values. Mm. And the point at which you turn around and say, oh, Walker's Crisps are going to give us a, a four-page spread pullout on new Leicester bands, you know, you kind of think, well, right, okay, that's fine, um, but, you know, really is it just going to be a packet of crisps and then a band and then another packet of crisps and you can end up actually reducing the trustworthiness of your publication as a consequence of that you know friend of mine was um i think this is not indiscreet to say it so i will <laughs> but a uh, friend of mine is was recently left being head of sales in the uk for vice mm. and he said is quite what makes them strong makes it very difficult to sell advertising there or sp sell yeah. sponsorship because he, he'd brought in a huge, well, was about to land a huge deal with a big brand sponsor. Mm. And then the editorial team ran a piece slating the sponsor's involvement with a music project mm -hmm. just as he was about to close the deal. Yeah, and they're like, and we're, they we're not having it. this. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and that would have been his parting gift mm. to the, the publication. Mm. And um, he was, you know, he said to the editorial team, oh, could you not wait until 
and we, we landed this. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but he said that because it's church and state, how editorial and advertising yeah. at Vice, and um, uh, and that that is that's bold. But they, you know, mm. they can they can afford to be that bold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and af afford to shrug it off if they lose a big deal because mm -hmm. of it. But mm. I think there are many. Um, it's probably always been the way, but especially now that a lot of it editorial decisions, particularly around music, must be led to an extent by the commercial uh, imperative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although you could argue that, that uh, all magazines and all titles do that in any case, <clears throat> because most of them start with a, a demographic in mind. Who are the people we're trying to reach? And what are their, what are their kind of underlying kind of tastes or values or things like that so if you look at a place like you know it's a venue rather than a title but you look at a place like king tuts it clearly has a value it clearly has a set of attitudes it clearly is closer to new and emergent than say you know um the, the concert hall is or or, yeah. or, or other yeah. venues yeah. and so that that sense of a place that has a value or a title that has a value is immediately identifying a potential audience that it will bring and how it then commercializes that or whatever. Um, where, where it becomes difficult is when the things are in contradiction with each other, where Vice, for example, given that, that example, uh, take money from a brand that's not synonymous with their values mm. and it therefore feels noisy and a bit kind of hard to deliver on, you know. The face struck me as kind of cheekily irreverent. Um, mm. Was it an intention to to make trouble or to to be provocative? <coughs> I think there was a provocation at the heart of it. There certainly was at the the enemy, and and perhaps more profoundly when I went there, um, Channel Four, where our core values were um, uh, were uh, do it first, make trouble, inspire change. They were the three brand values of the uh, emergent Channel Four of the. 90s and so um yeah i think that those things of provocations can be really really important there are, there is a there is a, a rule of thumb now and it may may be true is that with the web and with the growth of the internet and with the growth of uh, web-based media it's simply harder now to be controversial you mm. know it's harder now to cause trouble because the web is a kind of free for all. There's stuff out there. If you want to go and find anything that's kind of truly edgy, it's out there already, you know. And and it's only kind of mainstream broadcasters and maybe kind of well-established traditional titles that can now get into trouble, you know. Um, because you know, I mean, you look at you know, you look at all the kind of new sort of titles that have emerged in this kind of alt-right era, Brightback.com and things like that. It's virtually impossible for them to uh, to say that they're led by shock because just about everything they fucking do is that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You know, and they're, I, I find that kind of like, well, what's the purpose beyond? Well, I can see what the purpose is for Breitbart is to rule America, but um, but what's the purpose in a world in which you can no longer shock people unless they're kind of so culturally conservative they don't know that the web's doing what it's doing? You know. When you went to Channel 4, yeah. um, was that quite a big leap from having writing about music yeah. to then um, making programmes or commissioning programmes yeah. about music? Yeah, uh, I mean, if I'm entirely crude about this, there's an old theory of uh, Karl Marx. You remember him, the uh, yeah, political philosopher? He said that in the final instance, the economic always determines. The difference between the NME and Channel 4 was 22 grand and 74 grand, right? So that's kind of what really kind of led me moving to Channel 4. It was much, it was a big career jump for me. It was a huge uh, jump for me uh, in terms of finance as well. I'd briefly come home for a year from London. I'd been based in London since um, I was a young guy, since I graduated. And uh, I'd come up the road to, to do, um, uh, as, 
and set up a small indie called Big Star and we did a, a couple of music projects for Channel 4 and it was during that period when I was a member of uh, PACT, which is the Producers Association, the equivalent of, uh, F, of SMIA for television. Um, and I be became a kind of figure in that movement and then uh, had been spotted, as it were. I was really well known by Channel 4 editors and they brought me back down to London to lead the independent film and video team at Channel 4, commissioning, uh, you know, commissioning late night television, late night documentaries and, and low budget dramas as well. It was a great job, best job I've ever had, you know. And you were there a long time. Yeah, I was there nearly 20 years, Channel 4. Longest yeah. serving director? By some distance, I would think, mm. yeah. Certainly the longest serving commissioner. I think there might have been somebody in finance and that that was there as long as me, but I was the, in the creative team, mm. I was, you know, the one that uh, was chameleon-like. They could never sack me, you know. <laughs> I just dodged from one to the other, you know. <laughs> and there was, throughout that tenure, um, a fantastic catalogue of inspiring, troublemaking and uh, firsts of uh, music shows, mostly yeah. live music shows. Yeah, quite a lot of live music shows. I actually was briefly, for three years, head of arts and music, so that would be, you know, 97 to 2000, something like that. And I remember uh, taking a decision, and this will provoke kind of conversation where you hear, I took the decision to kill a show called The White Room, and it was a, it was a, a live music <coughs> show and it made me come over as a kind of pariah and a stigmatic figure in the music industry because it was one of the few shows where you could plug a band, as it were. And I remember people being, he, he's killing the white, who is this fucking idiot? You know, is that kind of thing. But of course... I loved the white room. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you did, you and the 400 other people, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and one of my jobs was to look at why the show was underperforming and why it was only making the niche um, audience that it was reaching. And it takes us to a really, really difficult and often quite unpalatable fact that music on television doesn't rate, right? Mm. It doesn't reach the audiences that other genres reach. Now, there's a number of reasons for that, and reasons to some extent that I've already explained in my own life, is that music can be quite fractured and subcultural. It's very, very difficult to find somebody who's um, deeply, deeply committed to Celtic music and for them to equally love electronic dance music and for them to equally love new rock and for them equally to love kind of uh, country or whatever. You know, they tend to be, music tends to have that strong fracturing subcultures. And there's a lot of people that make judgments on live bands. If they don't like or they I don't identify with the types of bands they're on, they switch off, right? It's mm. cruel, but it's true. You don't have the same kind of uh, thing in the, in, in, in the world of drama, for example. No one would turn around and say, oh, it's about the Secret Service, I'm not watching this week. Well, they might, but, but it's not kind of how people don't look at, uh, at drama in the same subcultural way. They'll give they, it more latitude. Yeah, they'll they? give it more yeah. latitude and also they'll be looking for things like quality, sophistication, mm. you know, um, narrative surprise, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, whereas I think in music we're still often very fractured in our tastes, you know. Is that because music's so emotive and it actually cuts through a lot of the, the conscious um, decisions that we might make about whether we watch something or listen to it yeah. on the radio um, and therefore very subjective do you think? Yeah I think there's a bit of that but what I would say perhaps more than that is that it's it's really interesting if you do the usual kind of conversation in fact I think there's been a radio show about this quite recently what is the best band you've ever seen in the Barrowlands? Let's say you ask that question in Glasgow uh, people will give you an answer if they've been there and they'll often feel very kind of proud of it or nostalgic for it or whatever. But they're talking about <clears throat> a night, a live experience, being in somewhere with their friends in an atmosphere and the kind of, you know, sweaty kind of thing. They've had a drink. This is a band they've always wanted to see. For me, it was Public Enemy at the Barrowlands when I first saw them uh, in Scotland. I'd seen them once in Camden in London. And it was just incredible. And nothing like that experience of being in a live venue, TV can't get close to it. 
it, it fails miserably. The White Room was about live music, but of course, you don't have the crowds, you don't have the kind of atmosphere, you're watching on a small screen. Uh, the band is usually not even always playing live, they're sometimes playing to kind of backing track and whatever, and the ones that are playing live tend to be the more the kind of singer-songwriter end of it, semi-acoustic, a cappella, that kind of thing, and therefore the atmosphere that you would equate with being at somewhere like the Barrowlands is just simply not coming out of the TV, you know, and so that again leads to people feeling this is not coming close to replicating the experience that I have when I go and see the band I love in a live venue, you know. TFI Friday did come close. Yeah, it did, yeah. TFI Friday, of course, had to uh, build around the music. You know, I, I was the commissioning editor of TFI Friday, and if I start with that, it, because it's quite important to actually go back over some of those debates, it came soon after the White Room. Mm. They weren't direct replacements, but it came soon, a soon after. But TFI Friday was about the pop culture of that moment. It was quite an important moment, especially if you're, uh, you know, a Scotland fan because Euro 96 was around at that time. Scotland were playing down in uh, London in England against England at Wembley. And at the height of that period of time, there was all sorts of different bands that were emerging uh, in, in, in the UK at that time, you know, the Oasis and, and Happy Mondays and all of that sort of stuff, you know, the Manchester scene and whatever. So there's quite a lot of things going on that were to do with the culture of the time. Comedians, stand-up, there's endless mm. things like that. So it wasn't purely a music show. Uh, I remember actually one of the greatest moments I love for it, and it's just a stupid, stupid joke. But basically, it was... Um, there's a, a scene in which the then, this shows you how ancient it is now, the then Manchester City team of 1996 were in a lift. Um, and <laughs> Chris Evans presses the lift, the door opens, and the Man City, or four of the Man City team are in the lift. And he just says, going down? And they were just <laughs> facing relegation at the time. It was just a, a great crystallisation of a stupid schoolboy joke, but it was just very funny. And, and in lots of ways, TFI Friday was good at that kind of capturing that zeitgeist. We did the pilot. Here's a really interesting thing. And um, Chris Evans came in uh, with the pilot, and he always brought his shows in with him. It was never the sense of kind of superstar would stay away. He'd always come in. And whatever his many faults are, Chris Evans, one of his greatest, uh, I think one of his greatest achievements as a creative figure is that he's a, he, he's a he produces from the chair that he's sitting in, from, you know, if he's mm. the, the host of the show, he's also watching and noticing what else is going on with the kind of architecture of the show, the theatrics of the show and whatever. And he started to show me the um, pilot of TFI Friday. And within the pilot of TFI Friday, uh, I can't remember who the band were. There was a big, big Manchester band on at the time. Let's say it was Stone Roses or whatever, right? And um, they showed me this thing, and it was in this cavernous uh, uh, hall, hall kind of, you know, warehouse thing and whatever. And he then went to interview Anna Friel, who at the time was on Brookside and was kind of one of the sexy young stars of the time. And she was one of the key interviewees for the pilot. And she was being interviewed on the stage, right? And then... It was just disastrous. You couldn't hear her. There was no atmosphere. The crowd were impatient. You could hear people shouting out in the background and whatever, you know. And then the next bit, Chris Evans is up on the uh, on the top, and he's introducing the next band, and he freeze framed it. I remember being in his, uh, he was in my office, and he freeze framed it. This is a funny moment. I'll tell you a story about this. He freeze framed it, and um, he said. Stuart, this is shit. It's just not working. I'm really sorry. I've wasted your time. But let me just show you this. He says, there's the show. And behind him was the bar. He said, all of the interviews are now going to be in that bar. And we're not ever going to interview on the stage. And the stage will only be for the bands and the live bands and all the rest of it. And he went and did a third pilot. So this was, I'd seen the second pilot. This was a third pilot. And that was what became TFI Friday. And he saw the benefits of how you could re- 
configure it, re-architect it, produce it, and whatever. And that's what it became the kind of TFI Friday that we now know. But in that meeting, curiously enough, he was at the time quite friendly with uh, Gaza, who at the time was England's top footballer, but was playing at the time with Rangers up here in Glasgow. And he had come up in these kind of slightly kind of seedy, controversial nights out in Glasgow where Danny Baker, you know, Gaza and, and, um, and, and him would go around and get pissed and all the rest of it. And I looked down just as he, he, was, he was talking about Anna Friel, and I looked down and he had a pair of Rangers socks on, right? This is Chris Evans in my office in Channel 4. And I said to him, what's this fucking ranger socks, right? And he said, oh, 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 oh. he says, they're, they're, they're just mine because of Gaza. I said, well, you can get them off for a start. So he actually <laughs> took, he took his shoes off, took the ranger socks off, put the ranger socks off to one side and we continued the meeting. <laughs> but being the kind of person that he was, he went straight out the next day to his uh, press agents and said, I was kicked out of a room at Channel 4 for having a pair of ranger socks fucking went mad all over the record, all over the, you know, and that was it. I mean, I, I was already a persona non grata in that part of town, um, and that kind of made it even worse for me. But that was the times when I, uh, when I thought Chris Evans was at his creative height, you know. Mm. He was a, a significant force, you know. He was, as, as uh, Des Lynham described him uh, when he was on that show, an iconoclast, and, yep. and he, he did smash conventions, and, mm -hmm. um, and did some some pretty uh, groundbreaking things as a yeah. as a presenter, um, but some of that had been trialled in terms of the way that music was contextualised in the show yeah. um, <coughs> with the word. Yeah, that's right, and and the word, and and maybe even uh, before that, networks, uh, whatever it's called, I can't even remember the number now, but the Sunday afternoon show, they were kind of part of that era of kind of trendy television and you know, making youth culture uh, part of it. To some extent, the Tube did that yeah. as well. So there was quite a lot of kind of predecessors of TFI Friday. TFI Friday just cranked up the comedy more, cranked up the interviews. I mean, there was, a, a you know, great interviews with top actors of the time and whatever. There's that wonderful one where, the, who was the guy that, the really posh actor that they used to have in the, in the bar? I can never remember his name now, but he was quite a famous, famous British actor. And they would get him to recite uh, lines from contemporary songs, you know, it was the, you know, all I want to do is zoom a zoom, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, really kind of mad fucking shit that was going on. And it was just a clever show, clever show, you know. Uh, I greatly miss it. But these days, there is precious little live music on TV. Yeah. And um, people talk about it with me all the time, about why Later with Jules Holland really is the only um, live music yeah. program. Yeah. Um, well, it probably is. Probably for the reasons that you've mentioned. Yeah, but I think largely it, for the it, reasons I mentioned. But it and is, a, it's a successful format. Yes, it is. But look again at the point I was making there, because Jules Holland um, is, is someone who has honed it down to a kind of post-blues style music. Uh, he, he loves kind of older, you know, bands that are coming in from the States that might be doing classic R&B or blues music or derivatives of country or whatever. And it's the music that's kind of, you know, the music of Memphis, the music in New Orleans, the music of, um, of, of um, Nashville and whatever, and any British groups that are synthesizing that sound. So it's actually quite narrow in its musical tastes, I think, as a show. It's not to say that it isn't good, but it's quite narrow, and it's highly, highly unlikely that a kind of uh, new kind of hardcore guitar band would ever be on that show, or even that a kind of gangster rap uh, group would be on that show. It's just not what he does, you know. He used he, to do that more. Uh, more, but he doesn't now, mm. and I don't think, the, the, I think the show, you know, there's a horrible thing to say this, but sometimes you think it's for, I mean, this rich coming from me because I'm, uh, well into my years now, but it feels like a show for old people. Is I'll stop watching it. Is that horrible, Dougal? <laughs> um, no? no, that's probably fair. Yeah. Um, but then, so... It's is, ageist, but it's fair. Is the place for new music um, not then on TV, but on the web? Well, mm. I wonder if it's the case that uh, m television's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every single day. And I wonder if 
and, and as so clearly as web-based TV and the capacity to kind of, um, you know, seed stuff in social networks and all the rest of it. But I've got the feeling now that when bands are emerging or, or they're creating their debut album or whatever, they should also be creating their debut media, you know. In other words, the two things were seen in the past as profoundly separate. A band, traditionally a band would record an album that had maybe two or three single tracks that would be released as singles and the record label through their kind of promotions department would have a video budget and they would get them to go and shoot a pop video which would then be put on MTV or the, the TV shows that would use video, you know, uh, T4, those types of places. But now I'm wondering if it's the case that you, you have to have media along with your album, albeit that it need not necessarily be expensive or overdressed or, or it doesn't need to be La La Land media. It can be just simply very cool ways of covering the recording of the track or whatever, you know. And I think there are plenty of great filmmakers and producers here in Glasgow that young bands, or here in Scotland more broadly, that young and emergent bands should be partnering with from the outset rather than as a kind of secondary thought, you know. And there, yeah, there are, there are some great um, examples of that. And when, when I started my first music media project, or first proper one, Radio Magnetic, the, we were yeah. one of the few um, outfits doing that, that kind yeah. of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, so now there are, there are many of them. Some, some great things like Tenement TV yeah. and so yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's... Um, there's, there's a hunger for that from the fans, I think, yeah, you know, you know, to get that context. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. And it's sometimes how I discover new music, even from Scotland, you know, where you, you'll be kind of tipped off about something or something will come into your, you know, your kind of social network or, you know, and other things like that, you know. And often it's the case, too, that it's a collaboration between someone that's a visual artist <coughs> and, and a music friend or there may be art school together, whatever, you know. And I just think that that's a much more enriching creative way of working than having the commercial department that has to make a, a, a pop video to give to TV companies. It feels very kind of cluttered that, you know, and often wrong, you know. And actually with, um, with the, I was going to say demise, but perhaps just the change, the shifting nature of where the music business is and yeah. you know the uh, the shift from traditional retail into other forms of consumption mm -hmm. then the um the need or the driver to create a pop promo yeah to get it on mtv mm -hmm. that's not gonna happen anymore no and it's not it's way. probably not a a good way either of kind of um thinking about it because let's imagine that you are let's imagine an emergent band and you're from uh, the city here and you've got some connections with, you know, uh, creatives, filmmakers, video makers, uh, you know, art directors, whatever it is, it's highly likely that over the next three years as your music emerges that you'll kind of seed it into either social networks or you'll have your own website out of which you'll seed things or you'll be placing your music and the, and the tracks in Vimeo or, you know, there's endless different ways of thinking about it. And I think the idea too is that it's often something that is, it's a way of pointing to things as well as you move around the world. If you've got a tour going of Canada, you also, Canada needs media from you as part of the promotion of that tour. And to have those kind of three minute clips or two minute clips or great little kind of promos uh, for all of your music is a good way of doing it, you know. And it's telling the story around, you know, yeah. you can tell your story or someone yeah. else can come and come tell, and tell it. Come and tell it, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you then have moved away from, well, as, as far as I can see, from the music journalism and the, the commissioning to mm. being an, an author, yeah. to, to writing long form. Yeah. Um, uh, was that a very different mindset to get into to write you know 424 pages of detroit history and yeah yeah yes uh, except for one thing it's what i'd always wanted to do right and so in lots of ways i kind of suppressed my real passion for i mean for literally for two decades it's an awful long time to kind of you know sort of uh 
go through it. But, you know, you build a life and you buy a home and you fall in love and, you, you know, you do all of those things and, you know, suddenly, you know, uh, you're on, you know, 100 grand a year and you're flying between different places and you get caught into a lifestyle and you end up kind of trying to fund a lifestyle that needs that kind of things. And then uh, quite late in life, I've uh, just recently become a father and quite late in life at that as well. Not quite as bad as Mick Jagger, but <laughs> a bit younger, but the same concept of being the kind of late dad. And we Jack come along. Now, he, you know, not only is, a, is he a wonderful, beautiful kid, but um, we were, I was commuting between Glasgow and London. Mm. And uh, one day uh, I was waiting actually to get a, a flight to Glasgow at Heathrow. And um, he was with me and I was bringing him up. He'd, he was actually for a period of time in a nursery, Monday, Tuesday in London, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in Glasgow. And I was bringing him, commuting him up. It was uh, before he was even two because you could get him on your knee and it was free and all the rest mm. of it. And I waited and waited and waited for this flight and then they eventually announced it was running late. Then they eventually announced it was cancelled because of engineering problems. And this was the last flight out of London to Glasgow. And I've got this wee thing with me. And, um, you know, I had to go around and British Airways gave me a help to go around that area to find nappies and milk and fucking, you know, mm. crap like that. And I, the next day I thought to myself, I can't keep doing this. And uh, my boss at Channel 4, when, when I sat down and spoke to her about it, whatever, she said to me, well, you know, we, we can't le lose you this year. It was just after the Paralympics, which I'd been managing. But if you want to set a date for when you want to leave, we'll make that happen. And that therefore meant I had a little bit of a kind of support to make that happen. And then I decided I was moving my life back home to Scotland full time and I wanted to write but I then by this time had built up a, an income not least from doing off the ball on a Saturday and my pension and things like that where I didn't need to worry anymore about going out and schlepping I could sit and write books and uh, so I put me Jack in a nursery in Denison next to my house and uh, I act as the kind of dad at home crashing away on the books so there's been Detroit 67 as you mentioned there's uh, Young Soul Rebels, A Story in Northern Soul. I've got Memphis 68 out this year, which is a, a new book about the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King against the backdrop of Stax Records and, the, and Memphis in 1968. Um, and that's really exciting. And quite recently, probably about a month and a half ago, I took on a Netflix project for a, a drama, which uh, I'm currently in this drafting the, uh, the pilot of that just now with one of my old buddies from um, independent production days, a guy called Paul McGuigan, who's the director of Sherlock and whatever. So I'm working with him on that. That's quite exciting as well. You know. And each of these projects, quite a different uh, narrative position. So Detroit 67 is really in-depth um, exploration or sort of inquisition into... Yeah. Particularly the mind of Barry Gordy, but, yeah, that's um, right, yeah. but <coughs> the the drivers behind Motown and yeah, um, yeah. Um, and what how Detroit created that music, and then from there you can sort of extrapolate how you know I've always been interested as a lover of Motown and a lover of Detroit techno of the kind of the relationship between those scenes yeah, yeah but you really delve deep into that well history. i mean the the book which is i mean i'm proud of it and it's got lots of great feedback lots of great reviews selling well you know there's been three or four imprints of it now so i'm pretty chuffed with it but basically one of the great things about my period in television was i really really understand cultural formats Mm. Um, because television is a format-based industry, whether it's factual entertainment or whether it's um, you know uh, even straightforward kind of uh, format documentary, there's the, it, 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 you're taught or you evolve the knowledge of how things are structured. And Detroit '67 is almost the perfect format. It's the story of the city of Detroit from uh, in the year 1967 from January through to December. So there are 12 chapters, 12 months, and this enriching story of the story of Motown, the story of the city of Detroit, and its, its collapse into riot in the, in the um, summer, uh, 
the whole range of different deaths, the war between young black teenagers and a white police force. You know, it's just, Vietnam. You know, it's just endless in its kind of um, in, in its scale and scope and the amount of research I put in. As you say, it's a bit of a doorstep, but it's quite interesting. When I was um, working on it, I always like looking at these. You know how one of the great things about the web is the listiness of the web, where it's things, three things we need to know about, blah, blah, blah. Seven things you need to know about this. You know, Buzzfeed have, have Buzzfeed, built an empire yeah, an on empire that. an empire on yeah. it, yeah. And it's all clickbait shit, a lot of it. Yeah. But sometimes it's good. And The Guardian do these things where five things you should know from the world's great novelists, right? And I remember uh, seeing this on a kind of Monday Guardian. I thought, oh, I'll have a wee look at this. And Elmore Leonard, probably the best ever uh, crime writer to come out of Detroit. His first piece of advice to writers was, never start with the weather, right? That was his first <laughs> thing. And on the first day of January, 1967, Detroit is besieged with the worst snowstorm in its history. So I had this perfect format and I had to start with the weather. Um, you do start with Barry Gordy looking out at the snow and it's eerily quiet. Quiet, yeah, it. yeah. So and I was, it, yeah. that was my fuck Elmore yeah. Leonard bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but then but no. Young Soul Rebels um, is deeply personal. Yeah, that was a faster, different. much faster write because I didn't have to research as much. A wee bit of research in it, but not a lot. And it's the story of my love affair with the Northern Soul scene over uh, the decades. And um, from, it's a scene from Perth, from Perth where yeah. I grew up, yeah, where I, I was a teenager in Perth, and when I first came into the northern scene, and all the way up to leaving now, and rather a, a, a end it kind of in the period of the, this web era we're in now. And um, it was quite a so it was an enjoyable write, and much easier to write, not less research, and therefore faster to write than Detroit 67. But um, interestingly, in the writing of that, I re-engaged with a scene that I kind of never as I've never really left. And I've got a phenomenal kind of Northern Soul collection and all the rest of it. And it's a kind of unique scene because it was the, to some extent, it was, you know, it was a kind of parallel scene to the punk scene uh, in the 70s, right? Uh, although very different, but nonetheless with many, many similarities, not least of which it was underground and it was unofficial and it was working class and all of those things. A great exhibition down at um, Street Level Gallery on Rock Against Racism that, that's there now this week. And I was down there last night just checking it and it just reminded me how vibrant a period that period from 1973 right till through till about 1980 was in, in kind of street politics and how music refracted all of that stuff. So uh, it t tells one of the stories actually of a club in Cleethorpes. It's a big, big club. If you're on the Northern Soul scene, it's called The Pier at Cleethorpes. Cleggy as it was nicknamed. And it tells the story in October 76 of the arrival of the Sex Pistols into Cleethorpes. One of the few places that stuck with them and allowed them to play their anarchy in the UK tour. And uh, there are about 400 punks from the whole of Yorkshire turn up for this event. And then on the Saturday, the Northern Soul All-Nighters in the same venue, the Winter Gardens, and on the pier at Cleethorpes, 1,500 people at the Northern Night. And if you did the history of working class culture and music, you could stay just in that week. And it would just mm. be a great... First time ever a fanzine was ever published, you know, was in that week, you know. So just great stuff like that. And I love the kind of collision of those scenes and their undergrounds and whatever. But the next book, Memphis 68, will be out later this year. I've pretty much finished it, looking at kind of... Um, we're in this kind of publishing world now where I'm having to get stuff together for uh, the London Book Festival, for, you know, Frankfurt and all of that stuff. So it's become slightly more of a kind of industry rather than mm. a love. And I hope I'm not getting sucked back yeah. into that whole world where it's all about the dosh, you know. <laughs> You mentioned fanzines there, and I, like I, I think that you, there are still some fanzines. Oh yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, but really, music blogs have, have picked up where yeah. fanzines left off. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see in contemporary music media, particularly in Scotland? What do you think we need, or or we should have more of? Well, um, first and foremost, I think that um, uh, for me blogs or, or kind of um, destinations or whatever they are uh, have to me to be culturally rich. I'm not interested in 
the purity of music. You know, um, I'm not. To, that's not to say that I don't have a love for music or whatever, but um, I, I like when you're when you're dipping into the culture around it and where it's it's kind of more uh, as much about the kind of way in which um, you know. I was, I was just saying, you know, before we came on on uh, on air, as it were. Um, I remember coming across this thing which was about, um, it was a Spotify thing about great bands from Athens, Georgia. They were kind of indie bands and, you know, whatever. And I remember playing the Spotify, you know, at home, listening to it and saying, you know, that was okay, but they could easily, we could easily have done that from Glasgow. We could easily have done it from Edinburgh. You know, it wasn't anything special. These bands were good, but they were not fucking brilliant. They were just good. And I was left feeling very kind of unsatisfied because I didn't really know enough about the culture of why these bands had emerged in Athens, Georgia at that time, how they connected with each other, what their, what their kind of uh, underlying social culture was in the, what they call the New South or whatever, you know. And um, I was very struck by uh, a piece that I'd read about four months later, uh, about uh, Bob Dylan meeting um, President Jimmy Carter. He'd met Jimmy Carter when he was converted to Christianity. And I was reading about Jimmy Carter, a guy that I'd never shown any remote interest in in the past. He was just a boring right-wing Republican peanut farmer who happened to be president of the United States. But it actually started to tell the story of how Jimmy Carter had played a role in the emergence of the New South. He'd been a uh, he'd been a kind of supporter of of creative talent of of shops of bands and all the rest of it because he believed that the South still held this kind of stigma for people in their mind they still saw it as the place of racism the place of social segregation the place of Jim Crow and Jimmy Carter was one of the people that had tried to in, invent a new South you know and that these bands from Athens Georgia were a product of that new South now if those two things had been together. I would have enjoyed the experience more, but I only found out one four month after I'd listened to the Spotify list, and it wasn't good enough to go back and listen again, you know. So, more of the context, more of the Yeah, story. more of the context. Look, let, you know, we, we're in such an exciting uh, phase of uh, Scotland just now, politically, culturally, and all the rest of it. You know, if you're, if you're someone from Finland, and you stumble onto a website that's given you insights into Scottish music, it would be virtually impossible not to talk about the politics of Scotland, about what's going on now in terms of our, our movement towards independence. All of those things are part of the cultural shape of the modern Scotland we live in. And if they're not part of it, then what, what's, the, what's the point? It's just some bands strumming, isn't it? You know? Well, music, doesn't, you know, music isn't made in a vacuum. There are some music makers in the room. Um, perhaps you'd, you'd disagree, perhaps you validate that. But, um, you know, music... It, it's, it comes from everything that the music maker, the composer, the, the musician um, experiences. And so it can't really be played in a mm. vacuum either, mm -hmm. I think. That's right, yeah. But I think that, I think that music that has an, an enriched story around it is always, for me, more satisfying. You know, that's one of the strengths of Detroit 67, is it keeps enriching the music that you're reading about, you know in the, the social place of Detroit in 1967, you know. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> I think we'll, we'll be hanging about for a little bit. Yeah, um, Although, yeah. how long you stay may depend on May the, depend on the result of the football the tonight. I made a game. profound error of judgment tonight. I had been told by an unreliable friend that our game against Rangers, a sports St. Johnson, that our game against Rangers at Ibrox tonight was being moved to the Tuesday night for TV and therefore offered Dougal this night has been a perfect night for me to come and talk. They didn't, and the game's tonight, so all of my mates from Perth are down at Ibrox, and they're going to text me the score, and if, it's, if St. Johnson get a draw or a win, we're going out in a bend around Glasgow <laughs> tonight. You know? So that's kind of what I'm really about. But so, I can certainly hang around for an, uh, half an hour or uh, 40 minutes or so, so, to, so to chat more. Keep your eyes open. But yeah, and, and Dougal, one thing um, whilst uh, Tam's out of the room. Um, <laughs> oh, no, he's coming back. Yeah. Is, he, is he here? Yeah. 
he's yeah. still away, right? Well, Tam's out of the room, right? Here's one thing. I, I love kind of um, these little bits of detail. Uh, I, I was promised that he might heckle. That was the... Oh, this is the, true, yeah. This was true. I was promised that Tam might heckle. But here's a really interesting thing. If you go back to the history of Perth, Dundee and Arbroath uh, into the 19th century, all three of those towns uh, had prominent jute mills and jute, the jute industry and whatever. And uh, guess what happened? In the 19th century, when there was quite a lot of worker strikes in the east of Scotland, uh, the device that they used to comb impurities out of uh, sacks and sackcloth and jute and whatever was called a heckle. That was its name. And uh, there was a series of incidents in Perth and Dundee where heckles were thrown at management during strikes, and the term became known as heckling. Ah. <laughs> so everything starts in Scotland, eh? Okay. All these, Indeed. all these wee wanky yeah. stand-up comedians. They tell me about the time you were heckled. If you told them the real meaning of it, they'd fucking die. <laughs> Well, Stuart, thank you very Lovely much. Lovely to see you, Dougal. Cheers. Good to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you.